Thank you very much for, for the invitation and thank you very much to, to the organizers to, for, for inviting me to this very beautiful conference. And uh, I, I, I must say I'm, I'm definitely not the one who, who has been knowing Frank for, for the longest time, but, uh, but still I, I remember the, the first time I met him. He, I was very young, it was in 1995. It was my, my first conference in the US, in Minneapolis. And, uh, and I actually remember very well Frank's talk. He was talking about the uh, Zakharov equation. And what I remember most is uh, two things. First, I didn't understand a lot. And probably there are two main reasons that uh, I was very young, I was working on completely different things, and Frank might not have been the best speaker at the time. <laughs> and the second, what, what I really remember most is, is really that while listening this, he was speaking, he was doing different mathematics. He was doing something which was not mainstream and which was different from what the other people were, were, were talking in, the, in this conference. And to the day, that's really what strikes me most about Frank's work is, first, I often don't understand, but second, it's always interesting and always very original. So, happy birthday, Frank. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, based on joint work with uh, Herbert Koch Nikola Zvetkov and Nikola Vesilia. And so it's uh, about uh, probabilistic and deterministic scattering. So, and, and in this order, which is, uh, uh, it's, uh, I will start with probabilistic, uh, and then I will show you that the, the probabilistic ideas actually led to a deterministic result, which is a little unusual because uh, these times it's, it's more, more often the, the other way around. It's more like people in probabilistic theory are trying to, to redo in some other similar context what people have been doing in the, in the deterministic setting. Uh, so I will explain to you uh, the known results about, well, some known results, of course, I'm not going to, to give you a complete panorama of the, of the field about the deterministic uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equations. Uh, then I will explain to you uh, what we are trying to do for, uh, in terms of Cauchy theory and scattering for random initial data in the context of uh, nonlinear Schrodinger. And then I will come back to, to deterministic uh, theory. Okay, so first I thought all my talk would be about well, defocusing NLS except at the very end on the, on the deterministic side where I would just say, say a few, few words because the deterministic thing has, has nothing to do with the, whether the equation is defocusing or focusing. Okay, so you consider, so, so it's, this is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation with nonlinearity u to the p, initial data phi. Of course, you have two conserved quantities, the L2 norm and the energy. So this is defocusing because the there is a plus sign here. The, the energy controls both norms. There's no competition. And uh, once you have this equation, you know that you have three cards estimates for linear solution. For, so you have, know that for the linear solution, you have an LP, LQ estimate global in time controlled by the L2 norm of the initial data uh, and the dual of, uh, of three cards norm for, for the source term. And then once you have that very standard argument, uh, contraction argument, show that uh, you, the Cauchy problem is locally well posed for H1 initial data uh, if P is not too large, depending on the dimension. And now this is the subcritical H1 subcritical theory. So this is a strict inequality that I put. Uh, I will not be interested in critical problems. And then you know that the time existence is bounded from below if the H1 norm is bounded from above. And then uh, you have local existence, uniform time of existence, control of the H1 norm. Nothing can happen. You can iterate your contraction argument and then you have global existence 
by a very, very standard thing. And of course, this, uh, this method does tell, tells nothing about the behavior of the solution. So you want to understand what happens for a large time. So that's the, the first question that comes to mind once you have a, a global Cauchy theory like that. Ah, okay, so if you look at uh, the different values of p, if you, you have 1 plus 2 over n, which is the, the discriminant between short range, where uh, p, uh, yes, p is larger than 1 plus 2 over n, and long range, uh, there should, yeah, there should be, and whereas p is smaller. So what happens in the long range setting is that, well, you can say things, there are some partial results, but you know that no solution can be asymptotic to a linear solution. It doesn't work, at least in dimension greater than two. Dimension one, to the best of my knowledge, it works for until the quadratic nonlinearity. And then it's not, it's not clear. Well, probably nobody expects it also in dimension one to, to have a scattering. Okay. Oh, maybe. Yeah, okay. Okay, so now you have the uh, famous, uh, famous classical result, which is scattering uh, results in H1. So I guess the first result of the kind is due to Gini Velo, and then I, I put some names, but many other contributors, and I put basically the name of, of the setting that I, I will be using. So you, you assume that you are in the uh, small range uh, regime, Oops. and then you know that for any H1 initial data, you can find asymptotic space, phi plus minus, in H1 also, so that when you look at the difference of your nonlinear solution and the linear solution associated to phi plus minus, then it goes to zero when t goes to plus or minus infinity. Means that the solution, the nonlinear solution, is in large time asymptotic to a linear solution. So in some sense, you have a, that's a, that's a, well, Easiest case of soliton resolution conjecture, there are no solitons, and the solution, the nonlinear solution, is asymptotic to a linear solution. Okay, of course, uh, you, you can write it this way, but uh, usually people prefer to write it this way. It's, it's essentially equivalent, of course, because you apply e to the minus i t Laplace to both terms. It's an isometry on h1, and so this is the same thing. Okay, so this is H1 scattering. This is the property I will be interested in. Okay, so now I have put uh, yeah, many contributors. So um, Ginny Branvelo, as I said, Nakanishi, and then Coliander, uh, Krista, Filanik, Takao, Katao, Planchon, Vega, Vicilia, and as I said, it's, a, it's, it's only a, a small list of, of the people who contributed to, to this. Okay, so now uh, the question I want to understand a little bit uh, are the following. Can you, can you find some other regularity thresholds? Second question, can you describe the behavior of the wave operators? Because it's, a, it's a really, wave operators are, are really a nonlinear object. So it's the, the map sends the initial data to the asymptotic solution. The, the proof tells you that they exist. They are explicit in terms of the solution, but not in terms of the initial data. So can you give at least beginning of reasonable descriptions? And then another set of questions where, where, which are very much related to, to random initial data is, is the fact that you know that NLS is ill-posed uh, in some, uh, at some regularity. So if, if the initial data are not smooth enough, and this is the threshold here, uh, then you know that there are no reasonable solutions. You are actually, so you, you have some kind of a norm, instantaneous norm inflation for the solutions. And so it's, you cannot solve NLS at that level of regularity. 
And the question I want to address somehow is whether if this is a generic phenomenon or whether it is only due to some very special initial data. So actually, if you want to prove this kind of result, ill positiveness, the initial data you, you consider are, are explicit. They are something like that. Uh, phi of x over epsilon and epsilon to minus uh, alpha. So it's just initial data which concentrate at a point. Well, could have taken minus x naught, of course. Concentrate at x naught. And then you just put the, the epsilon factor in front to ensure that your function, your family of function is bounded in HS. So it's really it's point concentrations. And of course, point concentrations or functions which concentrate at the point are definitely not typical functions. So, of course, they exist. But if you think of choosing a, fun a function randomly, it's never going to concentrate at a point. In some sense. OK, so now I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, random initial data. And so I have to tell you the, the rule of the game. And the rule of the game are here to ensure two things. First is that I'm going to prove some results. So the rules have to, not to be not too drastic. And second, I have not to cheat. So there has to be some rules. Otherwise, if, okay, I will show you some examples of, uh, well, you can start the same things which are, which are crazy. OK, so the rule is the following. You want to undo the set of distributions with a non-trivial probability measure, which is supported in some uh, HS space, or at some level of regularity. And then you want to show that you can solve your equation locally, or in some cases, globally in time, for mu almost every data, in some cases, on a set of positive measure, which sometimes may already be something. And, and then you want to also ensure that the measures are supported on a set, here HS, where you know that you don't have a good deterministic theory. That's the part I'm not cheating. But of course, it's, it's, it's a, there's a, there has to be a balance. You see, your initial data have still to enjoy some additional properties with respect to the HS space, because otherwise you, you come to, to these kind, kind of counterexamples. You know for, for, for this one, the, situ, the, the solutions are going to be poorly behaved. So you want to know that functions of that kind, in some sense, have zero measure. OK, and then, and then you, you want to go further. You want, for example, to show that, in the case of this talk, that we have almost surely scattering. And in some cases, we want to be able to show precise the behavior of the wave operators. So it probably called tall beer. OK, so now a little bit of history. So the starting point is definitely Bourguin's work on, on Gibbs measures for NLS, where he implemented the, this strategy uh, precisely because but it, it was a, a different idea somehow. So for Bourguin, he had the Gibbs measures, which were living at a very bad uh, regularity level, so namely just below L2. And the NLS in 2D is well posed only for H epsilon. So there was a, a, a small gap. And so since he wanted to study the Gibbs measure, he had, he was forced to develop this Cauchy theory for this particular random initial data distributed according to the Gibbs measure. So now, later with Svetkov, we, we actually changed the point of view. The idea we had was that we're not going to let probability be an enemy. What we want to find is some examples, on the contrary, where probability is going to help you. Probability is going to give you some new examples for which you can say things, whereas 
In the deterministic case, it's bad. So somehow, we wanted to give examples of data for which NLS is much better behaved than what would have been predicted by the deterministic theory. OK, so now I'm, I can give you, the, to my knowledge, the very first result of, of that kind. So it's a, a result on uh, uh, one dimensional. So where the result is the following. You can construct measures supported on a H minus epsilon. So it's actually in a base of space, B0 to infinity for the experts, for which you can prove global existence for NLS in 1D, whatever the, well, well, the nice point is that it doesn't see the size of the nonlinearity. It's true for any P. And then if P is larger than 1 plus 2 over N, uh, N is 1, sorry, so P larger than 3, you have almost sure scattering. And 3 is the best index you can hope for because it's, uh, it's the result that I uh, reminded you a little before. Below 3, it's never going, there's never going to be, to be any scattering result. OK, and, and now second, which is a remarkable thing, it's the following. It's, you see, the initial data here lives at negative regularity, but the scattering phenomenon here happens at positive regularity. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. So you see, you look at two terms, neither belong to this space, but the difference is more, is more regular. So it's something that tells you it's precisely the, somehow com accomplished the, some part of the program. You have a description of the wave operator, the map U, U0 sends phi plus minus. So it's actually equal to the identity plus a term which is smoother and decays. And the convergence in your scattering result satisfies a better convergence than the regularity of the two terms. OK, so actually, uh, a few comments. The initial data L2 are not better, so it's possible to show that there are no, in no H epsilon space for epsilon positive. They don't have any decay in X in L2 norms. And so they don't enter the usual deterministic theory. And what is nice too is that it's not only that, uh, well, we, we have a very good statistical description of the evolution of the, of the measures. And also here, what you see here, you have good decay properties for, for the solutions. And if you look a little bit, if you forget about this log to the one half, this is the best decay you can hope for because it's the decay given by the linear solutions. And it's true even for small p's. So you don't have scattering, but still you have the same decay as for the linear solution, except for log loss, almost surely. OK, so now a little history. So after, after this result, there were many, many extensions of uh, in, the, in this direction, so uh, Aurélien Poiret proved, uh, so it's more, it's not almost sure, but it's global well positiveness and scattering on a set of positive measures for more general measures. And then you have a, a, a set of results by Brinkman, Donson, Neumann, Mendelssohn for random perturbation of uh, energy critical NLS, and then extensions to higher dimension in the radial case. And then the beautiful result, simultaneous result by Combs and Shane Sofer Wu, uh, will also have global well positiveness and scattering for, for some, some other measures than the, the one I'm considering here. So it's in this, in this business, you, you can play with the method you're using, and you can also play with the kind of measures you are using. So that's a, there's a lot of room to, to work with. 
Okay, and a nice thing about all that is that all the result in this, uh, all this, all this result in the random data almost shows scattering, they exhibit the same couple of properties. And it's inherent to the method of proof. You have well poisonous at a regularity threshold where deterministic NLS is ill-posed. That's one of the motivations for, for using uh, random data in this setting. And you have this smoothing property of the wave operator, which is the identity plus a smoothing operator. And so natural question is, of course, is whether this randomization is, is important for the second property or not. And, and there actually it turns out that you just have to ask the question and you have the answer. The answer is no. So actually this property with, which came from, because in, in the context of random Cauchy theory, it's natural to prove a result like that then it's actually always true, or at least true in a, in a large setting. So now I, I just state one example, but what I think is that this is a quite general result, and we, we checked only this, uh, this, this one, but there's no reason for it not to be general with, with some numerology, of course. So let's, for fix the ideas, you fix dimension to be three, P equal three, so it's the cubic, NLS in dimension three, so per, perhaps a, one of the most simple models, then it's easy to see that it is uh, short range, and you have GD one velo H1 scattering results, which tells you that for any initial data in H1, you have uh, asymptotic space, W plus minus of phi, and your, your solution is asymptotic to the linear solution associated to this asymptotic space in H1. And now the result is the following, same as for uh, random data. The wave operator W plus minus is the identity plus smoothing, and you actually have convergence. It's, it's the same term. You have convergence in H2. Well, H2 minus something. So exactly the same thing. With a proof which is completely different. And nice thing is that the, the proof of, of this theorem is actually, well, if you want to go up to H2, it's, uh, you have to put some technology, but I will show you, it's in two pages at the end of the talk, the proof for H3 half. Okay, so now let's go back to, to random data. And uh, I'm going to, to define, for, of course, uh, in all the business, you have to define the measures. And if I state, okay, there's a, I can define you a measure uh, for which there is uh, almost sure scattering, I, I said nothing because I, I can take, of course, that mu is delta u0 equals zero. So, an interesting thing. So, I have to define the measures, I have to tell you they are non-trivial and they enjoy still some nice properties. Okay, so one way, there, there are plenty of ways to define uh, probability measures, and one way is to use the, uh, a compactification of, uh, of our D by using the harmonic oscillator. So you have, uh, if you look at the dimension D harmonic oscillator, you have the eigenfunctions are, uh, you have eigenfunctions which are Hermit functions, uh, and they have uh, eigenvalues which are 2n plus D. And if you look at the kernel of uh, the harmonic oscillator, minus 2n plus d, it has large dimension, so it's essentially uh, asymptotic to n to the d minus 1. And you can decompose, of course it has compact resolvent, so you can decompose any uh, L2 function on a basis, on an eigen basis of L2 made by uh, eigen functions for the harmonic oscillator. So I decompose initial data in L2, I can sum on n on k of these are the coefficients times the again functions. And now the, the play is very simple. I am going just to randomize these coefficients. So I'm going just to, to change randomly the coefficients. And the only constraints are, well, here I choose uh, 
independent, so I change the coefficients independently. Identically distributed, which are basically I choose a Gaussian of a mean zero and variance one, but any random variable with fast decaying law would work. And now the probability measure I consider is the, is the law of the random variable that I get by this randomization. Right, so basically what I'm saying is, is when I say something saying new almost surely, I'm saying for almost every initial data of this form. And the first glance, you, you, it looks like uh, I've done nothing. I started from a function in L2 and I just changed the coefficients randomly. And you think that it, it should not be very different from, uh, from the initial function. So actually it is very different. Okay, so now I have to assume a non-pinching property. So this is, I have to ensure that my L2 mass is distributed uh, evenly on the, on the, on the EN eigenspace. So there is mass in, on, on many uh, eigenfunctions, on many, uh, on many of the Hermit functions, H and K. And so this is this property saying that each coefficient is smaller than a constant times the average of the coefficients. So it means that I can have some very small coefficients. I can put, say, half of the coefficients to zero. That's not a problem. But I cannot have large coefficients with respect to the others. The coefficients cannot be larger than the average. Of course, the value of A has no importance whatsoever. Okay, so now, uh, under this assumption, it's possible to prove, so HS is different here, so it's the HS uh, harmonic space, which is uh, the set of functions, so for non-negative S is the set of functions for, oh, there should be an S here. The DXSU is in L2, and X to the SU is in L2. Right, so if I take U0, so U0 is my function, which I use to define the measure. So if I take u0 in HS, then almost surely my random function is in HS. So basically, everything happens as if the Gaussian random variables were bounded. Gaussian variant random variables are essentially bounded. Now, so this is some kind of a good result. I didn't I'm not considering some too bad functions. Now, this is a result which shows you that I'm not cheating. If I take u0 in HS for possibly a S larger than the one which was here, then almost surely my function is not more regular and not decaying faster. Right? So, meaning that in terms of L2 regularity, L2 integrability, my randomization did not improve things, right? If I started with a function which was not very regular, almost surely my new function, my family of function is not very regular. In terms of L2 norm, now in terms of LP norm, it's much better. You, you have, in LP, you have S derivative and X derivative. Uh, as soon as, uh, okay, so this is true if you started with this zero. So you started with an U zero in L2, and then you have some decay and some smoothness, but measures in LP norms. So you see some kind of a reverse Sobolev inequality. Usually, if you want to bound the L infinity norm by the L2 norm, you're going to lose D over two derivatives. Here is the other way around. You start with L2, and then you have S derivative in L infinity. So it's Sobolev embedding the other way around. Okay, so of course it's not true for P equal infinity, but true for all the others. So, so in some sense, my initial data do, oh, sorry, do have some decay, but not measures in L, not measured in L2 norm. Okay, no, a, a small comment. This is not unreasonable to ask. Why so? You are in RD. 
So a typical function is going to spread over Rg. So it's exactly the opposite of that. So it's rather something like that. And now, this, if you measure in high Sobolev norms, it's small. Right? So this is the kind of phenomenon that's happening here. OK, so now I'm going to, to say uh, another uh, almost sure scattering uh, result, for which the, the proof is, uh, is actually not very difficult. So I will, uh, I will tell you uh, it's uh, less technical than the 1D result that I, I stated uh, at the beginning. So it's, a, so it's a new result that telling you, yeah. For, so it's also cubic, cubic analysis. You take dimensions smaller than four. You take initial data in L2. You randomize. So you have a measure which is supported in L2. And if U0 is not smoother than L2, your initial data are not smoother than L2. And then the theorem tells you the following. So almost surely you have scattering in L2. And actually, you are better because the wave operator is the identity plus a term which is in H1. So it's again one derivative and one decay in the power of x. And as usual now, you have convergence in H1. OK, so now I, a few words about uh, uh, how we prove a, a result like that. So the first step is to use a, a compactification of space, space time in some sense by using so-called so lens transform. And then you, you, you prove uh, that you have a local probabilistic Cauchy theory uh, for harmonic oscillator equation, nonlinear harmonic oscillator uh, Schrodinger equations that I'm going to, to show you. And then you have a, a globalization argument, which is actually very easy. So it's just a, an energy estimate. And the, the only tricky thing is, is uh, to find the, the good energy to choose. And once you have it, it's, uh, it's essentially, it's, it's not difficult. OK, so uh, first, the lens transform. So the lens transform is, is defined here. So it's an explicit transformation that uh, I'm not going to, to write. But the thing is that this transformation conjugates the flow of the linear and the nonlinear and the nonlinear Schrodinger equations with and without harmonic potential. So first, this tells you that you have a conjugation of the linear solution. Now, instead of saying you, I'm just going to, to write on the, on the board uh, a commutative diagram. That uh, is the summary of this. You know, in, in 10 years ago, I, I, I was able to write an, an exact short uh, sequence on the board. And, and today, I can write a commutative diagram. That's uh, the kind of uh, fulfillment of a career. <laughs> so you start from L2. You have at time t equals 0. You have L0. And L0 is the identity. Right? Just check. Then you have L2. Here you have the flow of linear Schrodinger equation, e to the i t Laplace. Here you have the flow of e to the i s h. And here you have L t. And you have L2, L2. Just, just check, it's, it's trivial that L0 and LT are isometries on L2. That's, uh, that's what uh, this factor makes, uh, makes for you. Right? You have T, which is related to S by S of T is tangent of 2T over 2. And now lemma 1 is this diagram commutes. To solve the linear equation here, you just have to take L0, solve the linear equation here, and go back. Lemma 2 is another diagram commutes. 
which is here you have the flow of cubic NLS, S of t, t prime, which is actually psi of t minus t prime, because it's, the equation is autonomous. And on the right, you have the flow of another Schrodinger equation, which is S tilde of S S prime, and I have to put here T prime. And S tilde is the flow of this non-autonomous uh, Yes, this, oh, sorry, it's the other way around. It's L of T, I'm sorry, this is <coughs> T, T prime, and this is S, S prime, sorry. The S is on the without harmonic oscillator and T is with harmonic oscillator. Okay, and so lemma two is just this diagram commutes, right? And now once you have that, S in minus infinity plus infinity here is of course equivalent to T in minus pi over four, pi over four. So solving globally the NLS is equivalent to solving the non-autonomous harmonic Schrodinger, non-linear Schrodinger equation on minus pi over four, pi over four, open on both sides. And scattering is equivalent to proving here closed on both sides. You're going to have, right? And now just a comment. Yes. Here you see the result is important that we put this on the left because I cannot apply E to the IT Laplace to both sides, because e to the at Laplace does not act on the harmonic H1 space. And so it's important, you see, when, when, I, when I do something like, like that, it's just a comment about, yes. If I use the diagram here, I start here. I apply my lens transform, which is L0. I solve the nonlinear, and then I apply e to the minus i s h. I come back here, and I come back here very easily because at time zero, the Lenz transform is the identity, right? And so that's why I need to apply this operator to go back at time zero. And once I am at time zero, I can transfer estimates here to estimates here. Okay, so maybe uh, I'm going to, to skip the rest, essentially, well, maybe very fast. So how do you prove a local Cauchy theory? So it's actually this way. You look at the solution as the linear solution plus a smoother perturbation. That's what I said in terms of probability. The fact that something will be smoother is inherent to the method of proof. Usually, the equation is not going to be well posed at the level of regularity of my initial data. But at the H1 level of regularity, in that case, it is well posed. Right, and now for V, for my perturbation, I have a, a harmonic nonlinear Schrodinger equation with a, a term which is like that, but basically, if you look at, of course, there, there are a bunch of, of cross, cross terms, but basically, if I keep only the two extreme terms, I have a source term and a nonlinearity. The probabilistic estimates tell me that actually the source term is bad in terms of L2 norms, but the cube of the source term is good. So this is a good term, which essentially lives at the H1 level. And now, the cubic term is not a problem because I can solve the cubic NLS 
uh, in H1, in dimension three, without any problem. It's not even critical. Right, so that's the idea. And then uh, very rapidly, uh, to have uh, an energy estimate, you just look at the energies, this one. So this is what happens. And then you just make a calculation. And I think I'm going to, to skip this part. And now uh, go back uh, to the deterministic smoothing property for, for the wave operator. So I go back to, to my deterministic result. And uh, so I remind you that the result is, is the following. So now there, there is no more probability in the game. I just take the old Gini Bonvelo H1 scattering uh, solutions. Uh, so this is Gini Bonvelo result telling me that uh, the solution is asymptotic to a linear solution in H1. And the theorem is that uh, we actually uh, have a, a better convergence property. Okay, so what I think is that it's basically we, we use just H1 subcriticality. And we expect this phenomenon to be true at a, in, a, in a very, very general context. Okay, so let me show you the proof in the uh, simpler case of where instead of trying to reach H2, you will reach H3 half. And I will explain at the end how, how to reach H2. Uh, it needs a, a little more technology, but... Uh, and so actually, the, the technology here was all done uh, at the end of the 90s. So it, uh, it could have been written in at the end of the 90s, this, this remark. Okay, so uh, we do exactly what we did for the... Or there should be a, a U and a U here. Uh, we do exactly what we did for, for the probabilistic theory. We, we look, we, we decide, okay, the solution is going to be the linear solution and uh, plus a correction, and the correction is going to be smoother. And the, the only thing is that you want it to be smoother, but uh, globally in time. And so the equation is just that V is the solution of the linear solution with uh, a source term, which is modulus of U square U. And now uh, we are going to prove the, the simplest estimate that u square u in L1 HS is bounded. And then by GML formula, v, which is this integral, will converge in HS to the integral from 0 to infinity. Well, it's actually e to the minus it Laplace v, which will converge. OK, and we'll proceed in two steps. First step. Just use scattering and prove that you have a global L1H1 norm. And second step, use bilinear smoothing to prove that we have a global L1H1HS norm. First step is here. We know that three cast estimates are globally in time bounded. So it comes, either you decide it comes from the proof of scattering or you can also prove that scattering implies that uh, three cost norms are globally bounded. And so you have a bound here, and then you just have to, to estimate the L1, H1 norm of U square U. So you take one derivative, and, uh, and you bound this by, you have U square gradient U. And gradient U, you put it in L infinity L2, so U in L infinity H1. And the other term is in L2, L infinity. And of course, Holder tells you that this will be L1, H1. And now L2, L infinity is bounded by Sobolev embeddings by L2, W16. Dimension 3, we only need W1 half 6, 1 half plus epsilon. So you have some slack. OK? And that's it. So L1, H1 norm. Basically, that's it. Now, a little more. This is the page for the L1 H3 half norm. So I recall you the three-dimensional bilinear smoothing effect. If you take two solutions of the linear equation, then for any s smaller than one half, you have uh, the product of the first solution times the gradient one plus s of the second solution in L2, L2 is bounded by the product of the H1 norms of the initial data. So you can go up to 3 half minus 0. Right? And now you use the previous estimate to write U as a superposition of linear solutions. 
So U is, by DML formula, the linear solution associated to U0 minus the DML term. And you write it this way, integral from zero to infinity, you have this one s smaller than t to account for, for the t bound, e to the right t Laplace, which was here, and g of s, d mu of s, and g of s is, is this function. And the measure here is little, so you have, you, you put the two terms in, in the same integral, you have a, a Lebesgue measure part plus the Dirac source which will account for, for this term. And so it means that U is the linear, free linear evolution applied to an integral which converges in L1, H1. And that's so it's finished. You had U gradient 1 plus S U in terms of the, the double integral with S1 and S2, which amounts to have your two terms. Both have a linear evolution. And if you just apply Minkowski, the norm of an integral is smaller than the integral of the norms. And now you have two products of three solutions as before with parameters S1 and S2. You just apply this, smaller than the inter double integral of the H1 norm, H1 norm, which is finite by the previous step. Okay, so now you have a good bond on this, and you just plug the good bond. You redo what you had done before, except that now you gain one half of derivatives. The L1 HS norm of u square u is bonded, it's essentially the same. So you have u square gradient s u, because of course gradient s of u cube is essentially this. Little technique, but it's essentially standard. And you just do hull there. L2, L infinity, and here you have L2, L2 bound that you control by the previous step. L2, L infinity is still bounded and you still have a, sl a slack of one half of the derivatives. And that's it. The L of four for H3 half. And just to finish, if you want to improve and go up to H2, well, you have to use a duality argument. You do have to do you, this bilinear smoothing gains you one half of derivatives. So to gain one, you have to do a TT star argument to gain. And to do that, well, the good functional setting is what people know, know now is the good functional setting for solving uh, NLS, which is the U2, V2 spaces of Cohen Tataru. And this allows for nice transfer argument as here, I just proved by hand a, a transfer argument. So I have an estimate for linear solutions and I transfer it to my nonlinear solution. So U2V2 is going to do it for U2. And the advantage is that you have nice duality settings, which will allow you to perform this TT star argument. But then it's more technical and this part is, is more recent technology. Probably could not have been written in the, in the 90s. Okay, so just a conclusion. So the proof I just show you is, is, is actually using only previously known results. Uh, to my knowledge, it's, it's the first deterministic result which was motivated by ideas coming from probability. And, and it, it's important for me because I, I think that people would have, would have thought before about a result like that if they had done what we did with the probability strategy. Because it's very natural to do this once you've done this probability. But of course, it uses none of the, of the techniques and methods from uh, the probability that uh, we use. Uh, I think uh, this should be much more general than the small particular case that I, I showed you. As you saw, it. Uh, the proof here uses nothing about the focusing of defocusing property. It just uses the fact that you know that your solution scatters, which is easy in the defocusing property, but it's also known to be true in some focusing cases. So what I just say is that you can use this as a black box in some cases. So once you know you have scattering, you can implement a strategy like that. 
Ah, and I guess it should be true also for for many other other equations. I think it should be it's true also for for wave equations. Uh, as soon as you know, you have scattering. Okay, going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and happy birthday. <laughs>
to the to the usual uh, flow because essentially if you apply e, e to the i t Laplace uh, this this commutes this is right so this is e to the i t Laplace applied to to u zero and so you have a good description of the linear flow in that case too without lens transform. But the constraint is something like that. You, you can randomize, but you need to have a, a good description of the linear flow uh, of your randomized data. Other questions or remarks? Okay, yeah, questions. <laughs> can you gain data detail also? Right, we, we do. Oh, deterministically? Yes. I don't think so, but I don't know. I, I, did, I have no, no result uh, in, in whichever direction, and but uh, I, I don't think so. What about uh, taking a project with Carlos? So imagine that you have a kind of a soliton resolution, so you have a radiation term. Uh, this is a particularly simple model. You see, you have, you have, ah, uh, yes, go. Yes, you, you just have to, to, to understand the, the self-interaction, right? If you are, have a soliton resolution, then you have a, a lot of the terms. You have the, the solitons and the interaction with the radiation term. The radiation term should be no problem, but you have to understand the interaction of the solitons. But uh, make the calculation and see. It's, I don't know, but it, it should not be very difficult to, to get convinced whether you, you have something or not. Okay, no more questions? So I guess we start again at uh, in 15 minutes. Yeah.